mechanical arm seized the 121 metre tall booster during a controlled descent on its first attempt. SpaceX had previously recovered first stage boosters after they landed on floating platforms or slabs. Even at this day and age, what we just saw, that looks like magic. That oh, wow. Damn, wow. Luke, you must have been insane. <laughs> we are still going wild over here, over there. Folks, this is a day for the engineering history books. Dr. Wendy Whitman-Cobb is a professor of strategy and security studies at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, and she joins us now from Alabama. Dr. Whitman-Cobb, uh, this was an engineering milestone. They managed to catch this booster rocket. This was a bold test, wasn't it? It absolutely was, uh, and it was it was amazing that they could do it on the first shot. I, I'm still not even sure that I saw what I actually saw. Uh, certainly, they've been preparing for this, and all of the uh, recovered landings with the Falcon 9 booster has helped them get to this point. On the previous test flight, they were able to land apparently within a centimeter of where they were planning. So they were pretty confident going into this, but even still, to be able to do something like that is, is really, really amazing. And before we go more into what was involved, what was the reaction like to this? Uh, I think over here in the U.S., I, it's an, it was an early Sunday morning. I was certainly up watching it. I think a lot of us who are in the space community are really excited by something like this. I think it's really exciting the public as well to see something new and amazing like this and, and the possibilities that it now brings for space flight and space exploration. So I think it's a really huge shot in the arm of excitement for all the things that we are planning in the next couple of years. Now, you mentioned the Falcon boosters just a moment ago, so that's on a, on a smaller scale, but SpaceX able to uh, get a bit more uh, sustainability in this space and therefore be able to launch uh, more often. So tell us a bit about that, how we came to this point. <laughs> Well, I mean, for most of our space history, rockets have been expendable. They've been single use. Uh, they get us a space and then we throw them away. Uh, but this new generation of space companies really came to understand that the way to make space flight cheaper and more accessible is to be reusable. Uh, and that is a really difficult thing to achieve. The space shuttle tried to do partial reusability uh, and it was successful to a certain point, but we all know that the problems that they had with the heat shield tiles uh, and, and other engineering challenges that they faced. So to do something that is reusable, at least on the scale of the Falcon 9, where that first stage booster is reusable, they have some boosters that they have now uh, reused over 20 times. And that really does bring down the cost of getting to space. Uh, and so when you can do something like they're doing with Starship where they're planning for it to be fully reusable, um, that is that rocket that they launched this morning is larger than the Saturn V moon rocket that got us to the moon in the 1960s. So to think about being able to reuse a rocket as powerful as that over and over again, those prices are going to come down astronomically, really allowing uh, states and companies like SpaceX to do the things like going to Mars that they really want to do. When we saw that roar of applause and those smiling faces when this was pulled off, I mean, obviously people were elated and also relieved, you'd have to say. Tell us about the risks that were involved here. There's any, certainly a lot of risk anytime you're dealing with a rocket that powerful with space flight. Uh, and I think the FAA here, which is in charge of regulating this, has also been concerned. Uh, they just got the launch license yesterday after a process that has been somewhat contentious. Uh, there have been concerns about the environment down there at Boca Chica. It's on the tex uh, border of Texas and Mexico. Uh, there's been concerns with their water deluge system that they use to sort of dampen the acoustical uh, effects of the launch. Uh, and so there are certainly concerns with that immediate environment. And also, you know, what should happen if there is a mishap. Uh, certainly precautions are taken every time there is a launch for those things that people are with well away from those uh, uh, those launching areas. But there's certainly risks involved here. Uh, and I don't think we'll be seeing them return the actual Starship uh, to land anytime soon until they can really prove 
uh, that they can do it successfully over and over again uh, with the pin type of pinpoint landing that they did achieve this morning, uh, which was really fantastic right off the coast of Australia, right in front of a buoy that they had specially placed out there. So that is really exciting. I think it's really great evidence of what's to come. Uh, but they're certainly keeping safety in mind. Well, I was about to ask you, what is next and is that it? Is it repetition? Absolutely. I, I also look forward to seeing it actually go orbital. So the flight profile for the past two tests, including this morning, was a suborbital. So it didn't make a full revolution around the Earth. So I'm really excited to see it make a couple of goes around the Earth and then come back in to land. Uh, so I think that will probably be uh, another big test objective that we'll see going forward, along with demonstrating that they can do this repeatedly over and over again, and also reuse of those boosters. Dr. Wendy Whitman-Cobb, great to have you with us. Thank you.